Americans for Prosperity is committed to breaking barriers across the country, and Americans for Prosperity is growing across North Dakota. By calling on lawmakers to reduce taxes, spend less, improve health care, and provide second chances, we can empower all North Dakotans to rise. We're fighting for you. Join us today so we can make North Dakota the best state to live, work, and raise a family. Americans for Prosperity paid for this ad. North Dakota Superintendent Kirsten Baszler joins me now. Uh, Kirsten was first elected in 2012. Uh, she was reelected in 2016 and now is seeking a third term as North Dakota's uh, superintendent. Uh, I, I guess the full term is superintendent of public instruction. Uh, she's seeking another term in 2020. Uh, in North Dakota, officially, the superintendent is a nonpartisan position, but Kirsten, you've you've sought and received the endorsement of the North Dakota Republican Party, and and, and traditionally, the superintendent Democratic superintendents do. Uh, your predecessor Wayne Sandstead uh, long received the endorsement of the North Dakota Democratic Party, so that's pretty traditional, even though it's a nonpartisan office. But you'll be seeking the endorsement from the Republicans again this year, I imagine. Tell us about your campaign. Why did you want a third year? Or third term, I should yeah. say. Third term, yeah. Um, because I didn't get uh, I didn't get everything done that I wanted to get done in my first two years. No, there, that's uh, that's kind of a, a short answer. But truly, you know, when you make these decisions in any position and any role that I've had, I really uh, always reflect to say, what have I accomplished? Am I still excited about going to work? Do we still have work to do? Do we still have good things that that can be done? And am I still effective in this role that I have? And so that's just been the way that I've uh, made those decisions, my career decisions throughout my entire, this is my 31st year in education. And so that's how I've made the decisions in the past. And that's how I approach this decision as well. It's like, have we been doing good work? Is there still more work to be done? And am I still effective in the role? And so when I was able to answer those first three questions with yes, then I went to the next set is, am I still happy doing this work? Is it still exciting to me? And do I still love the work that I do? And how does this fit with my family? And so when I was able to answer the first three questions with a positive yes, I went to those and I was really able to answer those next set of questions as an absolute yes. This is, I still truly love and passionate about the work that I do for the 120,000 students in our state and their families. And I still really believe that uh, I am effective and my family was very supportive of it. So when I had all those things in place, that's when I decided to to run for another term. Well, let's let's talk about the last. Well, it, it'll be eight years at the end of your your current term at the end of the year. Um, so the last two terms in office, what have you accomplished? What, what can you point back to and say, this is what I did for you, North Dakota? So as you begin to think about contemplating running for re-election, you really have to enumerate those things and be, be ready, and it's part of your decision. And as I sat down and made the list, I, I am very, very proud of the work that, that, that our team did at the Department of Public Instruction. It's been an incredible uh, seven and a half years or seven years and three months right now. The team that we built is, is an amazing set of people. They are the the majority of our, our team here are former teachers themselves, some are principals, some are former superintendents, and they've all come to work at the Department of Public Instruction to make a difference for kids. They all were happy in their former positions, but they saw the work that we were doing at the department, and it's because of that team effort that I think we've been able to accomplish so much. The very first thing that, that I really had to do, though, in my first, my first couple of years was to really get a handle on the operations of the office and really make it, uh, bring it up to date is, is how I guess would best say it. And so we, at the first, the first couple, the first year that I was here, we had employees scattered all over office space in the capital and throughout the, 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 the capital city of Bismarck. And so what we began doing is bringing people together. So we brought all of our employees to the office space in the capital, which saved us thousands of dollars in rental fees each year. And then we started, I started to look at the efficiency of our, of our operations. How could we do, do what we needed to do and become more efficient in those operations. And so over the course of the first term, as people retired or moved on to other positions or moved because of family reasons, we were really able to uh, consolidate and make our operations more efficient, which has allowed us to decrease uh, the number of employees by over 10% from over 100 FTEs when I first took office to 88 employees this year. And as I mentioned, just a, a crack pot great uh, they're just top-notch um yeah, don't, don't call don't call them crackpots <laughs> no i won't call them crackpots <laughs> 
I, I understand That's what you're true. saying. I do that Thank all the time. You. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? They are just a crackerjack team, as I guess is what I was There we go. To That's say. what, yeah, they, there we go. There, there you go. And so we've been able to do that with no increase in our base salary or operations budget for the past, de- past decade. So that's kind of the internal operations. And that's what we had to do, you know, set, set work to do that first, that first couple of years. So then we get that team in place. We get the efficiencies underway and we begin our mission of what we, ex- why we exist. And we exist truly in this state to make sure that our students and their families are able to make their students' dreams come true. Um, I have a sign uh, in my um, office that is uh, it's a, a, an etching on the wall that asks the question, how are the children? And there is, a, there is a, an understood and often repeated sentiment in this office that the reason that we pull into the parking lot every day at the Capitol is to make sure that our students have what they need to make their dreams come true and be everything they can be. And so we set forth a a, a culture here that is based on three pillars in build relationships, cultivate opportunity, and inspire growth. So we set about making sure that we built the relationship for a time. Well, when I was a when I was a teacher, when I was a building principal, and when I was a school board president, when I would hear from the Department of Public Instruction, my first reaction would be when I saw the letter or the email, is like, oh geez, what did we do wrong? So we had to recreate our culture of making sure that we are building relationships and under, helping our, our our citizens and our school community, our education stakeholders understand that we're here to help them. That rather than um, not wanting to hear from us that we became the first people they call when they had a question or they needed assistance with something. And so because of that relationship building, we were able to cultivate opportunities with both uh, public and private sectors for our school districts to take advantage of. And through that, we've increased our graduation rate over the last seven and a half years. We've saved our families more than $4 million in college tuition by bringing college credit courses to our high school campuses. This allows our students to take both uh, classes that give them both high school credit for math, English, and science, and computer science, and earn uh, college credit for those, getting a jump start on those college credits. Yeah, t- tell me, tell me how home. much how much family – I mean, and, uh, by the way, I should say uh, my yes. daughter took college credit courses at Monet High School, in, uh, and she's now at Bismarck State College pursuing a degree in nursing – uh, but yeah, was able to save her daddy a lot of money by uh, by, by taking some some college credits at Mina High School. So uh, thank you for that. What was that figure overall, though? I want to I want to drill down on that. That seems like an important figure. Absolutely, it's truly an important figure. It is over four million dollars in college tuition as of the end of last school year. Over four million dollars. So it was absolutely insane. That's um, so on. It, it's almost. 4,000 exams, AP exams were taken at $3 a credit per exam. So, and giving, having students earn 11,600 college credits. So yeah. an amazing amount of savings it that is, has been achieved. It, it, it is remarkable. And like I said, my, my daughter participated. It was, um, it was great. So thank you for that. And, you're welcome. Level. And, you know, I'll drill in a little deeper onto that, too. Um, as you are aware, but some people might not be aware that I have a state superintendent student cabinet. And that was created during my first term. And my student cabinet members, that very first inaugural student cabinet group, shared with me, they brought to me, as you know, uh, they brought to me, they bring to me, they continue, the, the next cohort have continue to bring to me things that are going well in their schools and that we need to keep doing. And they also bring to me things that aren't going so well and we need to do, to do better. And sometimes they bring to me things that are going so wrong that we just absolutely need to stop doing them. And one of the issues that they brought to me in my very first term was the understanding that the students that are going to our larger school districts like Minot High, like Bismarck, Mandan, Jamestown, Dickinson, of course, Grand Forks and Fargo, have multiple opportunities to take uh, dual credit courses or these AP exams. And what I was hearing from my student cabinet members is that that amount was was limited in more of our rural school districts that didn't have as many of those opportunities. And so this student cabinet really was. They were the initiators of this idea. They brought this idea to my attention, and we problem-solved it together. So then in the 2015 session, 
this group of students uh, testified on behalf of having the legislature support the, um, the initiative that brought these exams and the funding for these exams to our high schools. Another thing that they really brought to my attention was there were a lot of kids that were taking the AP courses, but weren't studying for the exams because they didn't want to risk the exam fee because their family wasn't in a financial situation where they felt that they could risk that, that $80 exam fee and maybe not get the college credit. And so the legislature really stepped up and said, you know what, every student in the state can take at least one AP exam to earn college credit and the state will pay for it. So those students that are um, in low socioeconomic families can take up to four exams for free. And if they pass it, it's reimbursed by the state. So um, I think that was a major, major uh, shift in allowing more students opportunity and access to being able to earn, earn college credit. Then, of course, we had um, a partnership with Exxon XTO that helped us train the teachers and our teachers then from all over the state, and even in our, our small rural school districts, were trained on how to actually make sure that their kids were successful in these AP courses in computer science, science, English, and math. And more of our kids have taken the exams and passed, which resulted in all of the saving. Let's talk about. I mean, that's it's it's that's a great resume. Let's talk about one of what I perceive to be, and and maybe maybe I'm wrong, but what I perceive to be one of the big challenges of your first two terms in office. You're completing your second term now. Was really the the fight over Common Core and standards. I mean, that was a very hot button issue in multiple legislative sessions during your tenure. Where does that issue set now? And do you feel do you feel good about where we're at on that situation? I do. That's a, that's a very good question. Yes. When I took office in 2012, um, we realized that our students and, par and parents weren't getting the truth about how prepared their students were for life after high school. There is what I call the honesty gap. And that bar was set too low. So in 2014, we raised the bar to better prepare our young people for the real challenges that they would face and work in college. And when we did that, there was there was a there was a very big struggle that centered on the Common Core standards, and it was it was a challenge that I, I I had absorbed and inherited those standards, and I realized soon into that first term that it wasn't implemented. They weren't adopted in a way that I operate. I I begin to start partnerships from the very beginning. I don't make a plan and ask other people to buy into it. And so I realized it, 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 this is what we had, but it is not the way that we should do business in North Dakota. So in 2016, in, in the summer of 2016, I brought all the North Dakota teachers together, any North Dakota math science or, or excuse me, math or English teacher that wanted to serve on this rewriting of the standards, anybody that applied, anybody that wanted to, we accepted all of them. And our North Dakota math and English teachers came together for the next eight months and looked at the current standards and made the changes that they felt were necessary to make sure that they were meeting the needs of North Dakota students based on what our educators felt and what our families were telling them. And we then adopted new standards in uh, the spring of 2017. So I feel that our teachers now are really able to focus on teaching rather than trying to explain standards that aren't ours. So I really, truly am so proud of the teachers in the state and their work and their effort to do that. I know some teachers were like, oh, goodness, we don't want to change again. But in the end, I feel like everybody feels that we have a better set of standards. And I know fully and the teachers know fully that they were standards that were written by North Dakota teachers with North Dakota um, students and, and families in mind. I know you mentioned to me outcomes are always the most important thing. I mean, it's great to have a more efficient <laughs> office. Uh, it's great to have increased graduation rates. Uh, you know, it's great to be saving money and have more kids taking college tuition. But if it doesn't turn into prosperous, you know, happy citizens, what's the point? What right? are we accomplishing? Exactly. So, so, so to me, exactly. what, what are the metrics that that are important to you that you look at and say? If you know, if this goes up, we're doing a good job. If this goes down, we're doing a bad job. What 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 metrics do you track? Absolutely, such a great question. And as we, before we go into that, which might be a longer detail, I really want to make sure 
sure that I that I um, share this with you. I would encourage everyone to go to insights.nb.gov. That's I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S dot N-B dot gov. It's a dashboard that will is available to every taxpayer, every citizen, telling exactly not only how much a district spends, but how much every school, how much every school building in that district spends and how their students are doing. And one of the metrics that you will find on there is what I am very, very proud of. And this was built with partnerships with our stakeholders and our families and our students. It's something that we call the choice ready metric, North Dakota choice ready. And so um, it's a transition from what I believe was an overemphasis on graduates being just college ready. There was an overemphasis, particularly in North Dakota, on just college ready, because our students must be choice ready. That choice ready translates into not only college ready, but also workforce ready and military ready too, which is a very important element to, to us as North Dakota citizens. And so now this choice ready metric ensures that our high schools will graduate students that are at least two of those three things ready. Um, we'd love if they were college ready, workforce ready, and military ready. But now our college high school, or excuse me, our, our North Dakota high schools are being measured on how many graduates that they, how many students they graduate that are at least two of those things. So you can be college ready and workforce ready, workforce ready and military ready, military ready and college ready. But that's what we're measuring is if a, let's just take my not, for example, if NINAC graduates 100 high schoolers, that should that's pretty great. But how many of them are two of the three choice ready? And if they only have 40 of their 100 graduates graduating choice ready, we monitor that, we measure that, and we want MINOT to see to, to say next year 60 of our 100 graduates are choice ready. And we believe that if a high school is graduating a student, they should be choice ready. So that's one of the main metrics that we use. So how, uh, how do you how do you very, quantify very uh, not to interrupt, how do you quantify choice yeah. ready? I mean, what does that mean? So okay, that's we have actually a chart. <laughs> so that says so before you can even go into the post secondary ready, which would be college ready, workforce ready, or military ready, we have a set of essential skills that every child, every student must graduate with or must must uh, demonstrate competency in, and that includes hours of community service attendance, because we were hearing from a lot of employees, our employers, that um, they just want their employees to show up on time. So we're measuring attendance. We're asking them to do community service. We're asking them to engage in work-based learning experiences. We're asking them to engage in co-curricular or extracurricular activities. Um, they will get credit if they complete a capstone project or an online learning course. And so once they pass through that 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 uh, that gate of being essential skills, post secondary ready. I will have to tell you aligns very much with our college admissions, with our university systems admissions policy, ACT exams, GPA, uh, advanced placement courses, whether they have a passing grade in algebra two, whether they take an advanced placement exam with a, a, a score of three or more. So the post secondary are very very much academic centric, workforce ready. Um, is based on more of your skills, your work-based skills. Um, have you completed three or more CTE courses? Have you completed the career-ready practices, which are the disposition, the activities, the, the attitudes and, and actions of, of a, a ready, employable, workforce-ready person? Um, do they have a workplace learning experience? Do, have they taken a technical assessment or industry credential exam? Those are the things that indicate whether you're workforce ready. And to be military ready is based on the things that the, the, um, the, the, the common denominator of the multiple branches of our military have agreed upon. We brought in our military folks in North Dakota and said, what do you believe is necessary before you will deem them military ready? So we base those components of military ready based on um, their recommendations of ASVAB scores, um, whether they have quality citizenship, uh, which is um, what we learned from the military is some are that want to join the military are not eligible because of choices that they've made that have brought them into contact with the uh, with law enforcement or the court system. And so we are basing ours on things that we have control over, such as no expulsions or suspensions. And then, of course, their physical fitness is a factor for military ready as well. What I would encourage everyone, that choice ready chart is available on our website at DPI because we really want to encourage our families to understand what's going to be expected of them and help us support their students uh, as, they, as they work to become choice ready for a North Dakota graduate. 
All right. So let's talk about politics. That's that's great. You, you made your case. That's what you've done the last almost eight years now. Politics is a very. I'm going to say one other. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I'm going to say one other thing too. One thing that I don't think that we can deny is is our is our academic scores. And I really do want to kind of shout out what our teachers have done in the last in the last decade as we've had this implosion of students in North Dakota. So our NAEP scores, which is the National Academic of Ex- Kirsten, I think we lost your uh, your microphone there. Better than they were at the start of the century, but more importantly, we've been forward and steady on our performance for the past decade. And the reason that I really want to call that out is because it's a tremendous accolade for our teachers in North Dakota. Uh, when a decade ago, our student, the North Dakota student population was ninety thousand people. We fast forward ten years, and it's exploded by almost a third. We have one hundred and ten thousand students in the public schools today. Kirsten, I, I, Kirsten, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think we lost your, your microphone there. Oh, oh that's, okay. uh, that's much okay. better. We can hear you now. Much better. Okay. So I guess I just want to, uh, that's a huge accolades for our teachers because these students came from all over the nation with all sorts of different backgrounds and educational needs. Our teachers rose to the occasion. Yeah. I remember my first year in office, I went to a school district and they had a student that would be in their, their seats the first day of school in the fall that hadn't been there in May from every other state in the nation. So that's huge. So I really don't want to diminish or, uh, you know, minimize how important it is that we keep our math and reading and, um, and English scores up. But I also want to say, I think it's a pretty strong, I'd like, that's what, that's what our goal is going to be for the next, next 10 years is make sure that, okay, we're, we've held steady, but now we're going to see growth. It is remarkable. I, I can remember when I was writing under the Hoban administration, um, the, especially the early part of the Hoven administration, we were talking about uh, former Governor Hoven. We were talking about declining enrollment in the state. I mean, enrollment was going down at that time. Um, yeah. it, it is remarkable what a turnaround and what a challenge that turnaround is. I mean, it's hard to turn just when you start thinking about the infrastructure and the buildings and everything out, the staffing, you know, having people with experience. You can't just turn on a dime. Uh, and we did in a lot of ways, and there's growing pains, and nothing's ever perfect, but it, was, it, it has been pretty remarkable. Let's talk about another four years. What are you going to do with them if yeah. you get them? So first and foremost, I I have become even more committed to continue the work of involving our families in the education of their children, uh, helping our local school leaders understand and help them receive the professional development, the training with their teachers that they need to make sure that our families are the true partners at the state and local level. And so I've, I've um, begun the family uh, engagement cabinet. We've brought in all sorts of, of training across uh, the state for our local school districts on not doing more, but doing things differently that actually have a high impact on making sure that our families are feeling like they're true partners in the education of their children. And so that will be a continued priority. Number two, um, began this in the last 2019 session, bringing at least one person credential to teach computer science, coding, or cybersecurity to every school building in the state. I've done this because I've heard from countless parents and families that they want their children to be prepared with these skills for the 21st century. Number three, uh, we have begun, we're going to build upon the partnerships with the private sector who support job training, internships, and school-to-work programs. We, we must show our students the many, many job opportunities they have in North Dakota to make us not only a good living, but a great living without building a mountain of college debt. And then finally, something that I haven't talked about a lot, but have just has been a true passion of mine. My father is a Korean veteran and a, a recipient of uh, the Purple Heart with two clover leaves, which means he was wounded three times, and, and the Bronze Star. And this is why it's passionate, a passion of mine. But I will continue to work with our local civic leaders, our veterans organizations, and our legislature to increase the expectations of the very, very, very important element of citizenship, patriotism, and civic responsibility. We started this work by passing the law requiring all high schoolers pass the citizenship test for graduation, but, but that was just the floor. Um, we have a, I'm working on a bill draft right now with some legislators to expect even more in this area for 2021 because 
it, it's not only a critical element for our children's well-rounded education, it, it's a critical element for the future of our nation that we ensure that this, this group of young people understand how important it is, civic responsibility, the patriotism, the love of our country and our state, and the citizenship and expectations responsibilities that they have. So I, get, that's, I've, that's I am, I am, I am glad to hear that. I, I, can, I can't tell you how much time I spend in my job. When I'm writing a column about, you know, I mean, it's it's we're in an election year, so I'm writing stuff about the legislative races and everything. I always feel like I have to go back and explain how it works, like how how the district conventions work, yeah. and then the state convention, and then the June primary ballot, and then the general election ballot. And even when I'm talking to people, it's like adults don't understand how it works. Yeah. They don't understand how do these names appear on the ballot? How do these people become candidates? It's 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 I, I don't want to say it's depressing. I don't want to get down to it. Listen, we're, we're busy people, and I get it. But we got to understand how our government works because we're governed by people, the people who show up. And if it's just a small That's minority right. of, of people who are showing up, man, you know, it's – we all need to show up and participate. So that's something I'm I'm very much uh, looking forward to is is really? uh, just because I I and see love, it. I, I see it and every love day. Country. And lo- yep, I do too. I do too. And what I also see is that these young people, I see it, you know, every time I visit a school, which I do frequently, I see it with my student cabinet. They're eager to become involved and they're eager to make a difference. But it really is up to us as adults to show them the correct and positive way that they can do this and the impact that they can have with their voice, but to do it appropriately and to do it, to do it within the confines of, of not just being angry, but being effective and impactful. So they're really eager to become involved. And it's, 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 it's I truly a, a passion of mine. And I'm really excited about this element of it. And, and the kids that I hang out with that are in North Dakota, they want to be involved and they're very, 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 I would say, appreciative of being asked what their opinion is. So let's make sure that we ask them and yeah. then show them how they can appropriately engage in the process. It, uh, yeah, I, uh, well, with the Greta Thunberg thing, I had a, I had a bunch of, uh, I wrote some provocative things about that situation and my attitudes about uh, young people voting, which are, I, I don't know, they are what they are. We don't need to have that debate. Now, it, it is interesting how many people seem to think I, I think the two are linked because people talk, well, why is everybody so angry right now, right? You see those headlines everywhere. And it's it's really mm-hmm. interesting to me because I think a lot of it comes from they just don't really understand how the process works. And it's almost like we're wearing our anger as a virtue. Like, I'm really upset about this thing and I'm going to communicate the fact that I'm really upset on social media. I'm going to make Facebook posts and I'm going to write you know, I'm going to write uh, angry comments on articles or other people's posts that I don't like. And it's, it's almost like I like I look at how virtuous I am because I'm so angry. And it's like, I think you're angry because you kind of don't like you want things to change. or You disagree with the thing and then you just want you want. But you don't really understand how it works. And so you just get angry and you write angry things on the Internet. Uh, and and is, I, I think it would be very I, helpful I if people understood these are the channels in which if you have if you're passionate about something, these are the channels into which you can you can pour that passion and actually change things. These are the mechanisms that, that exist. Exactly my goal. Exactly my goal. I couldn't agree with you more, Rob. It is they they get frustrated, they want it to be different and they don't know how to engage in the process early to have their voice heard and so then it just boils and it simmers and it's uh, I, I you know but I suppose it's a lot easier to go to, you know, sit at your computer and be angry about it than to go to a, 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 yeah. a county planning yeah. and zoning commission. And so that's why leave, I leave being angry at people, the leave being angry at the computer to the professionals like me. <laughs> there you go. But you know what? I also want to make sure that we are talking about um, the same group of people, because I think it's too late. I, just as I think it's too late to introduce high schoolers to job opportunities. It's also too late to just introduce middle school and high schoolers to um, civic responsibility and help, you know, have them understand it at that point. I believe it's important that we begin at kindergarten to become help our kindergartners and our first graders and our second graders become aware of all the number of job opportunities out there. So when they're in middle school, they can start exploring them. I believe that same thing about the, the understanding of patriotism and 
citizenship and civic responsibility. I think we need to begin engaging our first and second and third graders and what role they play within their community. And that is in that is within our social study standards. We just need to have them rather than reading about other people doing it. We need to help our young first, second, and third graders understand what role they play by helping and contributing to first their school community and then maybe their town community and then their county committee community. So we need to start a lot earlier than expecting middle schoolers and high schoolers to understand what their role is. And so that's what part of this bill draft is about and helping them understand. Because once you get a kid involved, an eight-year-old involved, man, they remember it forever and they feel part of that community and they feel part of something bigger and they'll never, ever lose that feeling. So that's kind of my goal. Kirsten, thanks for your time today. Certainly appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll talk again as, uh, as the election season unfolds. I look forward to it. Thanks for what you do, Rob. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to visiting with you again.